Hello and welcome to Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm your host, Ryan Robertson. This week, we are taking a deep dive into the work of the talented folks at the Air Force Research Laboratory. From fighter jets to physiology, they've been helping shape the world's best Air Force for nearly 30 years. Plus, we hit the tarmac for an up-close look at a new jet tasked for a mission that never ends. Plus, I answer some viewer questions in comms check and wax philosophical about intelligence in this week's wrap. But first, some headlines you may have missed. A new report from the Government Accountability Office shows American troops are not getting enough sleep. According to the GAO, surveys conducted by the DOD over the past decade reveal most service members report getting less than six hours of sleep a night. The DOD recommends at least seven. I was going to insert a joke about this into the script, but the GAO says the lack of Z's has led to fatal accidents and hundreds of millions of dollars in damage to ships, vehicles, and aircraft. Fatigue and sleep deprivation among active duty service members continues to be more the rule than the exception. Impairment from fatigue can be equivalent to the effects of alcohol intoxication and increases the risk of collisions and mishaps. The GAO made nine recommendations to the DOD, but acknowledged having made similar recommendations in a 2021 study that military leadership said they had no plans to implement or monitor. Australia and BAE systems are taking a dip together. Under the AUKUS Security Pact, Australia will buy up to five nuclear subs from the British firm. The pact, signed in 2021 between the leaders of Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, is a trilateral security partnership. No matter where you are, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific, whether it's in the South China Sea, the Red Sea, or in the North Atlantic, it is absolutely vital that that freedom of navigation is continued now and forever into the future. And that is why this enormous commitment by all three countries working together in AUKUS is so critically important. The deal will see Australia become the seventh nation to operate nuclear-powered submarines. But don't expect to see them anytime soon. Work is expected to start in the late 2020s after at least $1.3 billion worth of new shipbuilding facilities are constructed in England. 80 years after the famed Easy Company of the 101st Airborne Division jumped into Normandy, France to begin the liberation of Europe, the men who portrayed those heroes in the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers will follow in their footsteps. The BBC is reporting a group of actors from the series that aired in 2001 are training in Georgia to make the jump on June 6th. Every year, thousands flock to the French coast to honor the troops who landed there. While there are no surviving members of Easy Company, the actors who portrayed them continue to honor their legacy and sacrifice by returning to the area. Alex Sabka Brady, who played Corporal Frank Mellet, told the BBC, If we can in some way, shape, or form keep these stories going and keep these memories alive, then that is exactly what we try to do and it does mean a lot to us as a cast. Band of Brothers was a 10-part miniseries released in 2001, which recounted the experiences of Easy Company's paratroopers during World War II. When you think of the word laboratory, what comes to mind? Certainly Hollywood has provided some inspiration over the years. It's alive! Entertaining, no doubt, but far from the silver screen, the men and women who make up the Air Force Research Laboratory are working across the United States, from New York to Maui, on very real solutions to very real problems. Since 1997, the AFRL's mission has been to discover, develop, and deliver new technologies to the fight for the Air Force and, starting in late 2019, the Space Force. I would say if you look at just about any airplane or any spacecraft that's out there, there's technology embedded in that that started out right here at the lab. And to be and to be clear, too, the laboratory is not just one building. Um, it's it is spread across the United States. 
Headquartered at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, the lab's director of strategic partnering, James Barilla, says you can find AFRL research sites in 10 states with a workforce of more than 12,500 people. We do that on purpose, right? Because we want to we we want to make sure that we're out there, uh, both uh, close to the warfighter, but also close to the different organizations that might have technology that that we are interested in. If you want some easy examples of where you can find the AFRL's work, Barilla says look no further than the F-35 or the B-21 Raider that's currently testing at Edwards Air Force Base. They're also working on many other projects that may never become household names but will still play a big part in helping the U.S. stay in front of near-peer adversaries like Russia and China. Projects like the Mutant Missile, which we featured in February. We got great team leads, we got great engineers, we have a, a vast pool of people cross-director at AFRL and cross-service that are all making significant contributions to this. this. This system would not be where it is today if we did not have the partnerships that we've created. And that has been crucial to our success. There are 12 directorates that fall under the umbrella of AFRL. Everything from human performance to space vehicles. All of which have the same end goal. Helping the warfighter wherever that fight may be. Uh, I know it's a great source of pride for the lab and, and for myself uh, to be able to support both the Air Force and the Space Force. Uh, but I'll say from my perspective, um, that there are really no seams between the two. I don't, uh, I don't worry from day to day if the people I'm working with are Air Force or Space Force. Uh, it's all part of one big team and that's been great. Not unnoticed by those doing the work at the AFRL are the winds of change swirling around the air and space forces. Budgeting concerns from Washington, D.C. and evolving threats from America's adversaries in Beijing and Moscow. Despite all of that, Perula says the core of their mission is unchanged. Uh, everything we do has a fierce focus uh, on making sure that ultimately uh, our airmen, our guardians, our warfighters uh, get that technology uh, and get it into their hands and get it into their hands quickly uh, and as uh, um, uh, affordably as possible. While the AFRL's efforts are focused on military applications, there are also civilian benefits, like the Global Positioning System, or GPS, which started out as proprietary technology that eventually made its way into your smartphone. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left-leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Miss tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. There's an old saying that goes, looks can be deceiving, and that's never been more true than with our weapon of the week. Meet the EA-37B Compass Call. In the simplest terms, it's an electronic attack weapon system. If it looks vaguely familiar, there's a good reason for that. Underneath its bulky exterior is the sleek Gulfstream G550, one of the most exclusive private jets in the world. Owned by the likes of Elon Musk, Mark Cuban, and his heiress, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan with a takeoff. We said he was on the runway the last time. Needless to say, the Air Force did not pick it up to keep pace with the celebrity jet set. After undergoing an extensive refitting, the G550 is converted into the EA 37B. While specifics of what goes into the aircraft are held close to the vest by the Air Force, we do know the comprehensive system of electronics is built by L3 Harris and BAE Systems. The job of all of that hardware and the crew of nine aboard is to prevent enemy combatants from effectively using any systems that require operator input. Basically, it's an interrupter, using technology to deny the other side an opportunity to use theirs. Disable the link between operator and device, and you can effectively disable the device. Or, depending on the software, hack into it and take it over. The EA-37B replaces the long-serving EC-130. In swapping the 130's four props for the 37B's Rolls-Royce turbofans, the Air Force is bringing a major upgrade to the table. 
The 37B can fly past 40,000 feet and cruise at more than 600 miles an hour, which is more than 15,000 feet higher and nearly twice the speed of its predecessor. Right now, the Air Force has an order for 10 of these electronic attack aircraft, having taken delivery of the first last year and the next five sometime this year. At last word, the first was undergoing extensive testing before heading to its permanent home at Davis Monthan Air Force Base near Tucson, Arizona. Hello, folks, and welcome once again to Comms Check. It's one of my favorite uh, segments of the show because it's our opportunity to check in with you, the audience, see where your head's at, answer any questions that you might send to us in our comment section below or into our email inbox, which is weapons and warfare at san.com, weapons and warfare, all spelled out at san.com. So let's go ahead and get started with this week's comms check. First one comes to us on a story that we had done about Ukrainian air defense systems, uh, Patriot air defense systems, shooting down Russian uh, jets in, in great numbers uh, in late January, early February. Um, in that story, I had called the war uh, an illegal Russian war that Russia had illegally invaded. Uh, we got this question from Peter Oldeminger. Who made those laws that say it's illegal to invade another country? Armed conflicts happen all over the world, but this one is illegal. Uh, it's a good question, uh, Peter. It's actually the, the rules governing armed conflict come to us from Article 2 of the UN Charter. Specifically, uh, the, the violation that Russia committed was Article 2, Section 4, which prohibits members from using force against the territorial integrity and political independence of any state. So when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, they violated the territorial integrity uh, as a means to impose its will upon the political independence of that state. It's a violation of the UN Charter. Um, there are times where the UN says it's okay for a nation uh, to go into another nation. Uh, usually that's um, limited situations. Self-defense is one of those. So if, if the, if uh, Ukraine were to attack into Russia, which has happened a few times, um, the UN would co consider that uh, legal because Ukraine is acting in self-defense uh, by invitation. So if Ukraine were to invite, say, France or Poland and say, hey, guys, if you want to fight, come on down, um, then the UN would say that would be okay. Uh, or authorization directly from the UN Security Council, which is unlikely to happen in this event because the UN Security Council, it's made up of 15 member nations, 10 uh, seats on the council, it's kind of an at-large bid and it kind of rotates around, but there are five permanent seats on the UN Security Council, uh, and they are the US, the UK, France, China, and Russia. So Russia is unlikely to authorize the UN uh, to, you know, send troops in, uh, peacekeeping troops into Russia, or into Ukraine. Uh, so, so Peter, to answer your question, who decides those rules? Uh, the UN, which Russia is a member nation of, um, decided the rules, they agreed to them. They know what they were breaking when they broke them. So that's why this war in Ukraine is illegal. Thanks for your question, Peter. Hope that answered, uh, answered your question. So the next one, the next comms check we have, uh, comes to us on a story that we had done here on Weapons and Warfare about Sweden becoming officially official uh, within NATO. And we got this question from DMT8192. Uh, we'll call him uh, Devin. Yeah, let's go with Devin. Uh, too bad us Swedish people did not get to vote on this. Um, Devin is, is saying that, you know, had he been able to vote on Sweden's uh, membership into NATO, he probably would have denied it. But I will answer you, uh, uh, Devin. The Swedes did get to vote on their uh, membership into NATO, if you look at it. Yes, Sweden does have a monarchy, but it's a limited constitutional monarchy, meaning the monarch is just a figurehead. Uh, the real power lies in the parliament, the Swedish parliament. Um, in the Swedish parliament, for those who don't know, it's, it's a, a coalition. You need a coalition to lead, uh, much like Israel, where it's multiple parties and you have to have a... Um, a, you know, totality of the votes, not a totality, a, a, a plurality of the votes in order to lead a government. Um, and the Swedish government is led by the moderate party. Uh, they've been in power since 2007. So had the Swedes not liked the direction that the moderate party was taking the country in, 
then they could have voted uh, to, to take the country into a different direction. Also, it shouldn't really come as a surprise that Sweden, after years of, of neutrality, uh, decided to join, uh, join NATO or you know, apply to join NATO. Um, you know, once the, once the Russians launched their illegal war, as we just learned, into Ukraine, that kind of gave uh, the Swedes all the, and uh, Finland all they needed to, to know, hey, we should join this uh, multi-nation alliance that will help protect us and that we can help protect our neighbors. Um, also, when you look at the, the Swedes' participation uh, in NATO uh, activities, NATO exercises, Sweden was the number one partner, number one um, non-NATO partner to participate and take part in NATO exercises for the last 30 years. Uh, there's also a, 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 uh, um, an organiz uh, a group, a, a partnership called the Partnership for Peace, started in 1994. Uh, Sweden joined that. They, there was another EU uh, a partnership that Sweden joined that had a lot of NATO member nations as well. Uh, so to answer your question, Devin, well, it was, might not have been up for a, a vote directly in Sweden to join NATO. Um, if you pay attention at all to Swedish politics over the last 30 years, then you, you kind of knew where things were going. Um, and it should not have come as a surprise necessarily that Sweden did, in fact, join NATO. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, anytime our, as, because we live in democracies, if we don't like the way that the government is going, uh, we can tell them that each and every time we vote, which I encourage you to do uh, as often as possible. So that's our comms check for this week, folks. Uh, as always, if you have something that you would like us to respond to, if you have a question for us, please send it to us uh, in the comments section below, or once again, by emailing us weaponsandwarfare at san.com. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, for this week's wrap, I'm going to continue with theme I picked up on as we were putting together the show, Intelligence. For militaries and governments, intelligence is one of the most important pieces of any victory. And a lack of intelligence or failure to act appropriately on a piece of intel likely means failure. Since the fall, we've seen a few notable cases of governments failing to act on intelligence. The Israelis had prior knowledge Hamas was planning and training for some sort of major operation before the October 7th attack. Israel's leaders didn't think the threat was worthy of worry. What happened? The Jewish people suffered their single deadliest attack since the Holocaust. Thousands of people in Gaza are dead, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is being accused of prolonging the war to prevent answering for his government's failure to act on the initial intelligence. And in March, terrorists from the Islamic State attacked concert goers in Russia. More than 130 people died. Even more were wounded. Putin was warned about potential ISIS attacks. The CIA gave the Kremlin the intel. Putin publicly derided the warnings, belittled the intelligence. The U.S. Embassy put out a public alert that everyone in Moscow could see if they wanted to, warning of a pending attack at places like concerts. The intelligence was ignored. People died. And now Putin and his cronies are trying to say Ukraine was somehow involved, passing off bad intelligence as the truth. What's truly sad is he'll probably succeed in convincing people of the lie. People tend to hear what they want go with an intelligence source they like rather than risk hearing the truth from someone or something they don't. Well, hopefully none of the decisions you or I make on a daily basis are as dire as those facing world leaders. Our choices still have an impact. And coming up this fall, Americans will absolutely have a choice to make and it will absolutely impact the world. So... We should learn from the mistakes of Netanyahu and Putin and plenty of other world leaders, including Americans, who failed to listen to good intelligence. So hopefully we were able to impart some intelligence to you during this episode of Weapons and Warfare. As a reminder, you can always let us know your thoughts in the comments section below or emailing us at weaponsandwarfare at san.com. 
For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.